so welcome everyone. Maybe some people having trouble parking, they'll come, they'll be welcome. Thanks everyone, uh, Josh, everyone who helped put this together. And um, especially I want to thank uh, Achak Rinpoche and Eric Solomon so much from their busy, busy schedule. They're really doing Kora, they're doing circumambulation of <laughs> Europe, the USA, a little bit around Marin, because cliffs there, I guess. And, um, and, um, and then here, they visit our, this used to be called the California Institute of Asian Studies. Oh, no, integral. We have about 1,500 students, MA, PhD, um, and, um, our program, so anyway, I'm Stephen Goodman, and I'm the program director in Asian uh, Philosophies and Cultures. And um, we were talking, I don't even know how it happened, but somehow, and then Rinpoche said, oh, the universe, <laughs> right? The universe brought us here. So um, a long time in the making, I know Eric and Rinpoche were working together for a long time, and now we see this moment here, this manifestation, <laughs> radically happy, radically happy. I, I have, you know, this is part one. It's like Tukurugian, this book of Marsha, um, uh, as it is, and then and then Eric did as it is, volume two, which is great. So I'm thinking radically happy. Your next book should be. In spite of everything, <laughs> you know, just you know, how to be radically happy in spite of everything. Anyway, um, um, it's really great that they took time out of their busy schedule, and um, our program, Asian uh, Philosophies and Cultures, uh, we have MA and PhD in Buddhist studies, Chinese studies, Hindu studies, and. Um, Wonderful programs. Many of our classes are just totally open for people to come by. Why not? Yeah. Why not? And um, we taught Sanskrit and Chinese and Tibetan. Uh, chuke, not conversational. Just uh, And so this is the book. Thanks to Shambhala and all your great people that put this together. And I know it was totally easy and there were no edits. Because <laughs> you know, Eric is always completely positive about everything. Yeah. <laughs> Critical. Um, so um, I want to read to you because maybe you don't know and didn't see the flyer. Thank you. Yeah. That's a bliss gun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to, um, from the book itself, uh, Pachuk Rinpoche and also Eric. So if you'll indulge me just for a second. So Pachuk Rinpoche is a premier example of a new generation of Tibetan Buddhist masters. He combines the most profound aspects of traditional wisdom teachings with his pithy, humorous observations of their ongoing relevance to the incredibly fast pace of modern urban life. Born in 1981 to a family recognized for their generations of spiritual accomplishment, Rinpoche was recognized by the seventh, as the seventh Pachuk Rinpoche, and incarnation of a great teacher and meditation master. He received ordination from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and he received a thorough education and training in Buddhist philosophy and meditation, studying with some of the most distinguished, accomplished masters of modern times. His main teachers being his grandfather, Kyabje Tuku Urgen Rinpoche, and Nishul Ken Rinpoche. Pashup Rinpoche completed his education at the Zonzar Institute of Advanced Buddhist Studies in Bir, in India, where he received the Kempo title. That's equivalent, maybe, to our PhD. He's able to playfully combine the scholarly tradition of his studies with the experiential tradition of his main teachers in order to give his students the necessary tools to discover the wisdom and compassion that lie 
beneath our habitual ways of seeing ourselves in the world around us. Now, Rinpoche travels the world, teaching in Buddhist centers, universities, monasteries, from Asia to the United States, from South America to Europe. So thank you for coming, Rinpoche. And Eric Solomon, whom I've known for many years, and we've actually done programs together yeah. back in the day. I don't know how many years we've known. 20. Easily. Yeah. 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 It's when he used to have white hair. Now it's changing a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Eric. He used to get into all kinds of trouble together. Yeah. Throughout his career as a Silicon Valley technology entrepreneur, and now as an author and innovative meditation teacher, Eric has been interested in, under in understanding the mind and how it functions, both as a user experience designer and as a mind hacker. Now, for those in their 60s and 70s, they'll have to figure out what that means. Okay. Yeah, someone else here returns it. Okay. They could go on I didn't like Halloween. That. I they could go on Halloween as a mind hacker. Yeah. I don't know what the costume would look like. A pencil protector. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Eric's interest in human computer computer interaction took shape when, as a teenager, he taught programming to children and school teachers. As a participant in the Logo Group at MIT's Artificial Intelligence Lab, this was really back in the day. Yeah. He interacted with some of the world's deepest thinkers on how to make intelligent machines. What was it? Was it Brainstorms? Mindstorms. Mindstorms. Papier. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of that yeah. if you want to look something up on that yeah. back in the day. Maybe Cliff remembers. Yep. Okay. This experience inspired a lifelong passion to understand the mind and how it functions. And it led Eric to study, to the study of Buddhist theories of mind and the nature of consciousness. He's been an invited speaker leading seminars and retreats in corporate settings, such as the World Bank and Silicon Valley tech firms, as well as in prisons, note the ordering of these things, prisons, temples, and Buddhist centers across the United States and Europe. It's progressively yes. Yeah. So thank you so much. And um, I could say more, but that would take up your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very Welcome. much. Welcome. Okay, so. You need to refer to the book? I think we know Have you seen it? it? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, only uh, a few weeks ago, Rinpoche and I in Austria saw the book together for the first time. We'd seen, of course, in computer, but as a real book, because, uh, you know, they have to print it. <laughs> so, uh, and it was, it was wonderful. There's a, there's a, just, it, I worked in software for a long time, and you never ship what you originally dreamed of. It's always a compromise. And this really was something that Luke Jane and I dreamed of, and it actually came out slightly better than we dreamed of. I don't know if, if um, you know, other people will like it or not, that's up to you, but at least I can say this is what we wanted to do and we did it, and, and there's really something to be said for that, at least. Well, I should mention that the book will be on sale. Oh, good. Here in the back. Um, should you be so inspired? So I think they ha they hear many is the practitioners or already heard my talk a few times. <laughs> They're really happy and uh, some compassion for many days. Um, the when you are when you are a little bit how you say crippled, cannot walk so well. What is the best friend? It's a stick. So cripple have an objective too, want to go out, want to buy things. But he can't go alone, he don't want to depend from others. So he only have a choice. The most cheapest way is simple few dollars worth of stick. The stick is such a important for achieving his goals or her goals. Right now, us, I cannot tell, I cannot say all of you, I cannot judge that, but just to assume all of us wanting to be happy, we join into different practices, meditations, exercise, yogas, so forth. 
now we are into this life and doing meditation, whatever we do. At the end of the day, what do we really need? Practice? What is it in practice? Actually, what we really need is a stick to walk. <clears throat> so what is actually a stick for our mind? Is actually reminding. Reminding is very important. Learning slowly and gently is a way to uh, progress. But at the same time, we always forget. Because we have very strong things to do in life, sometimes strong responsibility, important responsibility, sometimes emotionally attached things, sometimes certain things that we really want, but we're not able to want. Sometimes we're so attached to our own self that we actually don't know how to let them go. End of the day, we need to have the stick. So, they could have thousands and millions of books. One of my friends showed me in Amazon, they have eight million books. Sales. And our radically happy book is somewhere 3,500, uh, somewhere in number. So now you know, they have eight million books in Amazon list. But how many stick we need to have? How many legs we have? Two. How many stick we should have? One. <coughs> Likewise, you can have one million book and you can read whole through. It takes thousand hours. By the end of the day, you are always begin from zero. Reason, we forget. We like it, we inspire, but we forget. We like, we get inspired, forget. The forgetting is actually what we really need to train. I've seen so many people who are long meditators. End of the day, sometimes they act like a childish. I've seen, so, I've seen such a great practitioners, long meditators, they act like a kind of wise man. And I look at myself, sometimes I'm a childish and sometimes I'm a wise. You know the difference? Child and wise? The only the state, the reminding. When I forget, I become childish. When I not forget, I become wise. So that reason, everybody wants to be happy. So, what to do now? So we use radical happy. The word of radical, I think Eric could explain. And in this radical happiness book, we first talk about basic happiness. And for me, it's very important, basic happiness. Because when you, know, when, you, when you don't have no safe place to be, actually, you are trouble. There are many people who love you, end of the day, you feel empty. I don't like to use the word sometimes, love myself, because it reminds me about reminds me that non-existent hate to myself. You understand? When I say I need to love myself, for me, it's a reminding, nicer way to remind, say, oh, you hate yourself, that's a better you love yourself. For me, I'm not talking for others. That's why I don't like to say love myself. I like to say kind, warm-hearted kind. Everybody wants unconditional love, and I'm actually urged for unconditional love. I meditate, I practice compassion, I study emptiness, but at the end of the day, I am actually looking for unconditional love. Wherever that can, can, can be come from, I love it. So because of that reason, the basic happiness is the actually making sure that you have a, some kind of steady mind. So that we created three steps in the basic happiness. So the three steps and why is radical, all that Eric is going to explain. But my point is I bring up is that why we are sometimes childish and why we are sometimes wise. It's just one single thing we forget or we remember. 
So that is the point that I want to bring. So I'm going to give to Eric now. Good. Thank you, Jay. We, well, maybe I'll start with a story because there's some of my old friends here who appreciate, thank you, appreciate this story. I, uh, I several times, I worked in Silicon Valley for many years. Now I live in France, but a few times I kind of wagered it all and lost. <laughs> it's a kind of normal in Silicon Valley. You take high risk, you get high reward, and sometimes not. But the second time I kind of got wiped out, I was so depressed. I've been meditating for years. It didn't seem to matter. All this, I, I remember uh, standing in my pool. I lived in San Carlos. I had a spectacular view of the bay. You, you were there, right? Yeah, yeah. And I could just, standing there, the hawks circling above, my wife standing on the edge of the pool looking a bit concerned. I'm looking at the bay. I couldn't feel anybody. I couldn't receive anybody. All I could think about was, how stupid I am. How, what an idiot. The point of this story is not to feel sorry for the affluent guy standing in the swimming pool <laughs> <laughs> who can't feel anything, right? It's showing how the mind is, how our minds are. Because the truth is, in that moment, I was standing in a swimming pool, my swimming pool, but I can't feel it. I can't receive it. I had a couple stiff drinks. I went to bed. I got a call at 5 a.m. Phone ring. Pick it up. Hello? Hello? Eric, it's Rinpoche. It's my teacher, one of my, my teachers from uh, France calling. And he says, I'm on the veranda with a glass of champagne celebrating impermanence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, hello, Rinpoche. He says, right now, everything's fine. Don't think about yourself too much. Boom, the phone goes down. <laughs> uh, okay. Bye, Rinpoche. I was actually kind of annoyed, you know, 5 a.m. I, I didn't actually think probably it's 2 in France, probably not sitting on the veranda with champagne and all this stuff. But I'm, I'm just... Yeah, it's like annoyed. He woke me up. Don't think about myself too much. Okay. So I, I take a shower. I, I sit down, do my meditation practice, and all of a sudden, I remembered. I remembered. I realized there were two times during the day I really was quite okay. One was when I was just doing my meditation practice, just allowing myself to be fully present without, in the face of whatever thoughts, emotions, sensations. And the second time was when I was going to work. Why? Because we had taken such a big hit. There were people on my staff, who, and now or on their staff, who weren't sure how they were going to pay for their kids' college education. They were suffering. I mean, at least I had an executive salary. I mean, I'm not even thinking straight, right? I'm, I'm fine. But because it's my duty, because I had to be there, I couldn't afford to spend time during the day wallowing. I just faked it. I was there. I was trying to offer comfort and some kind of support for the kind of all the emotion that I was being surrounded with. And in that moment, I'm not thinking about me. It's funny. It sounds such a simple thing, but I remember that moment of remembering is the most magical, important moment. We're always scolding ourselves in that moment. Always saying, oh, why didn't you remember? It doesn't matter. That moment of remembering. So to bring it back to, to this book and happiness, the first step is what we call basic happiness, which is right now, everything's okay. In this very instant, there's three parts to that. We call it always react to thoughts the same way. Relax the, sorry, relax the comparing. And finally, be present. So always react to thoughts the same way. Relax the comparing and be present. What does it mean, always react to thoughts the same way? 
Well, that sounds kind of weird. But what is always happening? What's always happening is we have a sense impression, such as I'm looking at this, I tasted this bottle of water. I live in France. Actually, I like the mineral taste of the water in France. This is like Coca-Cola bottling company that they filtered all the flavor out of the water for all the benefits. I really miss the French water. You know, I can't wait to get home and drink that water. I actually like the one just over the border in Spain a bit better. And you see what's happening? I go from a present moment sense impression, and suddenly I'm in Spain. Right? We, it's not the thinking is bad. It's the habitual thinking about thoughts that brings us away from the present moment. Of course, there are times my wife's an artist. As part of her creative process, she allows her mind to wander. That allowing the mind to wander is where she gets some of her best insights. But it's a choice. It's not like when I'm at the cafe looking at the bottle of water and daydreaming about Spain. That's just habitual. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, Rinpoche's grandfather said the very basis of our discontentment is the ongoing, never-ending evaluation of the quality of experience. The little sports caster in our mm -hmm. head that's going, oh, that's good, oh, that's bad. And then we think about each thing, and it brings us farther and farther away from just being present not trying to reject anything, not trying to bring anything closer. So always react to thoughts the same way means that we practice, we call them exercises, when a thought comes, just stay present, rather than thinking about it. So that gradually, we get that becomes our habit, and that thinking, choosing to mind, let our minds wander, can be a choice we make, right? rather than just always automatically. And then we, we find in, um, there's a fantastic uh, study that was done in you see here in San Francisco, where they found that people who were present moment focused were far more likely to be content, even when something bad was happening, than if they're allowing their minds to just think habitually about thoughts. Wow. Okay, so that's, always react to thoughts the same way. Relax the comparing. Relax the comparing. Wait a minute, I want to say one more thing about always react to thoughts the same way. So, for example, we start in our book this exercise we call creating space. We might do it a little bit in a bit, but we visualize space. We allow ourselves to feel spacious. We place our attention on this feeling of spaciousness. And then of course, after a while we forget and we're thinking about water in Spain again. But then we notice. And that moment of noticing is very pure. Maybe it's an instant, and of course then the thought comes, you're distracted. But if we don't get into, oh, you were distracted, that's really bad, and just come back to space. We've interrupted the habit. We've experienced a taste of our own pure natural awareness free from any kind of conditioned response. You want to say something? No? Okay. So, <laughs> it's amazing. It's delightful. It's basically happy. So, now relax the comparing. Relax the comparing. What's the problem? As this habit of thinking about thoughts starts to get out of control, gets more and more solid, we've all had this experience of a looping thought in our head, an anxious thought in our head, that we just can't let go of. It's often some kind of comparison. My life against how I imagine it should be, which imagine should be is up here, my life's way down here. Imagine me is so perfect, my life is so imperfect. are constantly struggling with this habit of comparison. It's, it's the evaluation gone wild. So just something simple like, I think about this one hoodie I love. <laughs> I think, I love my hoodie. I replace comparison with appreciation. and be present 
how do we bring this present moment awareness into daily life? So the idea of the basic happiness is actually making sure that you have a, some safety place to be. So I have a one um, saying that is the meditation is blind. Okay? It's coming. <laughs> meditation <laughs> meditation is blind. Really. When you do not reflect yourself. When you meditate before, in and after in the meditation, you do reflecting. Meditation know exactly where to direct. So there are three principles actually that directs your meditation, present moments. I use the now meditation because many of you do meditation. But actually in the book we don't like to talk about the meditation because the word of meditation now becomes heavier and heavier. So that's why we like to use and repeated the same exercise. Exercise. Always react, always react to thoughts the same way. Uh, react in the same way, creating space, be present moment, all this kind of stuff. But we don't like to use word meditation. But actually, of course, we, we actually use talking little about a little bit, but not so much. So that is one thing. Now, creating space is very effective because I seen it many many meditators, and I seen it. It's very interesting. I've seen it in a relationship and I've seen it, I saw many times about person who's meditating, the family complains. What they say is, Rinpoche, my family member who does meditation a long time, the two things we like to don't like. First, he's not so um, reactive in emotions. He doesn't have no empathy. He doesn't have no sympathy. He's not actually part of the family. He always is untouched by the emotions. Number second, we don't like him because they look like he's always running away from the problems. When we start talking about his, oh no, okay, I'm, I'm going to meditate now or something, always kind of have excuses. And when I see this, I agree somehow. Certain level, I agree with that. And the reason behind is that I think the person who doing the meditation actually has the same symptom, sim, sim, symptom. symptom of emotional. So that is what, when you become emotional, what happens? You lose space in your mind. You know that? Like that? You know, like, you, like that? Now you start meditating. Very uptight, physically uptight. <laughs> you know, I've seen it so many times. When you do exercise, they all go like this. Jump, 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 you know? Everybody starts moving, moving towards, uh, how you say, onto the table, chairs, you know, they're trying to move. I I seen my meditation masters, they meditate because they don't move much, they go. They're talking to you like this. They, go, they sit wherever there is. It's like, you know, the game, statue. You know the game? I don't know, you play. Yeah. Okay, statue. Yeah, you need to stay. Yeah. Okay, statue. You, you can stay like that. Meditate should be like that. Huh? Whatever you are, just pose. Not with this this uh, preparation. Uh -huh. So, the interesting part that I saw is creating space is not actually running away from situation. Why? First, when you create the space, you feel spacious. Isn't it? Then, when the family members complain or friends complain, you're not having empathy enough. Then you reflect yourself and remember the, the, the what situation happened and see it and try to repeat and to relive in that situation and see how you can to behave well. Then you don't lose the space in your heart. 
you actually do it exactly. Number secondly, when you talk about the problem issues, when they complain like this, when movement you are losing the space, you try to remember split second, few split seconds, try to remember the spaciousness feeling that is actually opens up your heart when you do the creating space. When you do the creating space exercise, you actually feel your heart open, chest relaxed and heart open. When that heart opens begins, then the uh, you can actually maintain that openness. Okay, so that is the creating space. Relaxing the comparison is a very important. You know why? Because happiness is a very beautiful word that everybody wants. <laughs> I want, everybody wants. But then happiness is actually one way to say it's a drug. I don't know, you don't know, but I see is happiness as kind of drug. You want, you want more. And you want more and better or equal or better. You don't want less. And the happiness when you get more, you're happy. But the, what is more, more? What is the end of the more? And when you don't get that level of happiness, you become what? You become unhappy. So whole condition to become happy, that condition, the result of the happiness, makes you unhappy. Why? Because you do not have a wisdom behind it. The wisdom is, relax the comparison. When you are happy, be present that happiness, enjoy the happiness, but don't compare. Moment you compare, the whole effort of the result of happiness becomes condition. That happiness itself becomes condition of discomfort. Not because of the happiness is bad, because you, what are you doing? Compare. So that's why the second the idea of basic happiness is doing, repeat the same thing in your mind, means creating space, feel the spaciousness, okay? Then, relax the compare. So, the Eric said, oh, I'm love with my hoodie, or I love my tea, I love my mala, kind of type. One way of relaxing comparing is actually seeing that you are comparing. The method, the real antidote of relaxing the comparing is a within comparing. The only way to do that, you need to see it. You need to see that you are actually comparing. That's why I said, having a knowledge is if you are a very smart person, like me. I study this book, that book, this book. Honestly, right now, I look back, experiential level, I have no one single page yet fulfilled. But knowledge-wise, I have 10 over books I study of Indian, Indian scholars. But when I look at the experience level, my one page of the Indian scholars or of Tibetan commentary people, I've not yet finished the one page yet. Experience level so late, but knowledge by so much. The reason behind is I always neglected to see it. What to see? Actually, I'm constantly comparing my experiencing. Constantly experiment, um, comparing things, feelings, people's reactions, family situations, physicals, how much strength I had before, now not. Every single, how many white hair, hair I had now and I do not have before, you know? Okay, all that, every single small thing we compare. So when you see the comparing, moment you see, ex the key is exhale. That moment, the split second, the freedom of your comparing begins. Then you need to, what Eric said, rejoice what you have. Hoodie, dog, whatever. Huh? You try to rip. So that kind of way to actually get, then you try to bring back the present moment. Present moment means not just like, how are you? Uh, I'm not talking about that present moment. You, when you're talking to somebody, be here to talk. When you are doing something, be here to talk. Don't daydream. Don't do daydreaming. 
Don't live in the future all the time. Don't live all the time in the past. Try to live this moment, this hour, this minute. Present moment does not mean split second all the time. Present moment means can we live in this minute. It's more relaxed. Now I tell you, okay, please, without any distracted, you maintain the present moment for one minute. It's, it's stressful. Why not say, just do how much you can present moment, just be aware that you are in this moment here. It's relaxing. So that way, gentle way to approach to yourself is very nice. So I like to tell my, uh, my friends that when you do this kind of exercise, always do that you are just just born baby. When you have just born baby, you know, the head is cannot, you know, like that, you know. So you need to put, you know, your this one very nice and you need to hold the whole body in the, um, on the hand, you know, in the wrist and you go like this and the head goes like that and you hold like this. Like how you handle just born baby. And our mind, actually, the wisdom level, the experiential level, we are just born baby. Physically, we are 37 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, whatever age you are. But experiential level, you are a just, just born baby. That's why you take care of yourself gentle wise. That's why we say in the book, how many minutes should you meditate? Then we say, Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> then all the traditional master go to say, What? We talk we did meditate so long. And my answer is this. Meditation. Why? Transformation. It's not time. It's transformation. How long would it take the transformation begins for you? That is the time. I cannot give my time to you and your time to me. I have a friend who is six foot four. He w one step is my two step. <laughs> and my attendant is five foot three, five feet and three inch. My step is his two step. So my friend walks, he's a four, four step, four steps. So that means what? I say one hour. For, for him one hour, for him four hour. <laughs> so time is a relativity. Don't use the time of the watch in the experiential level. You know why? You can actually enjoy a movie, very good movie, and that two hours movie can experience like a half an hour. So enjoyable. The movie is so bad, the one and a half hour movie feels like three hours. So relativity time cannot be experienced time is different. So meditation time is not a time of the watch, it's experiential time. So what is the guideline, guideline of experiential means transformation. Not like, oh yeah, I feel so good, yeah, oh my God. No, I'm not talking about that kind of experience. I'm talking about transformation. What transformation? I'm always comparing now I am less. Before I cannot be present, now I can a little bit. I always lose the space in my mind, now I can maintain. That is the transformation we talk about. So after you have that, what happens? You, you have your own home. You know when you stress, you can go to the office room, private room, or a toilet, sit on the Potties, <laughs> lock the door, split seconds or one, two minutes, three minutes. For me, I take almost 30 minutes, but whoever, how long you take. <laughs> Just a few minutes. Creating space, present moment, relax, you're comparing, and back, get back to that. Then you go back, you know exactly you can have your own home. But that is enough to be happy? No. You need to have interconnected. And I am who practice compassion. I think I am a devotee of compassion practice.
I cannot say I'm a compassionate person. It's very am high. But uh, I'm a devotee of compassion. But as a devotee of compassion, sometimes I don't know what does it mean interconnected. <coughs> I forget. So, likewise, I said before, meditation, you need a stick as a reminder. Compassion actually need stick. It's interconnected. So interconnected happiness have three three things. Number one, contemplate the interdependent nature of reality. See, you know, I cannot say that. It's so long. <laughs> Second, <laughs> contemplate. Oh, number two. Yeah, number two. Okay, yeah. Uh, relax. Relax the, the judging. Judging. Yeah. Number three. Oh, be attentive. So now I'm going to give to the Eric to explain what does meaning inter uh, this one yes. very long part. <laughs> I want to just say one thing, just to make it really clear about this comparing thing. I'm sure at least once when you were having the perfect day, all right, everybody's had a perfect day, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, everything. And what do you do? You think to yourself, maybe sign. Oh, too bad every day can't be like this. <laughs> right? Is so anybody who hasn't done it? Never. Never. <laughs> Never. See? Even in that moment of perfection, you have a little too bad going on because of comparing. Because of comparing. Okay. Just want to make sure everyone really gets that point because we always, sometimes we do this all so fast. So now, Contemplate the interdependent nature of reality. Why? Why do I have to contemplate anything? So much going on in my life already. <laughs> What's the biggest problem? There's this new disease going, that's spreading like wildfire in cities. Do you know what it is? Busy. What? Busy. Yeah, well, that's another one. Loneliness. Loneliness. All of a sudden, they're recording more and more loneliness. People are surrounded by other people. Alone. We are, perhaps because of busyness, because of the super fast pace of modern life, because everybody's struggling so hard to keep up, mm -hmm. we are becoming disconnected more and more and more and more. Yet, the reality is what? What I do affects you. What you do affects me. What we all do affects our environment. What happens in our environment affects us. Every level, from the subatomic particles to just normal, you know, psychological discourse, whatever you want to call it, we're all connected. When we live in harmony of it, what's the result? Well, that's a good question. So there was this study done in Harvard over uh, 75 years following people from cradle to grave. Oh, four different groups of researchers had to do it because this went on for so many years. And this guy, George Valiant, wrote a book about it. And to summarize his conclusion, happiness is warm-heartedness, warm-hearted feelings, kindness, love. Happiness is love. What did they find? People who were caring for others had better marriages. They made slightly more money. They came to the end of their lives and it didn't matter what their job was, they said it was meaningful. They found their life had purpose. So the first thing, basic happiness, is Really a little bit, what Rinpoche is calling a home base, we have to learn how to simply enjoy. We have to have some kind of present moment awareness, which we all possess, but we're always forgetting about it because we're off thinking about thoughts. But then, here, in interconnected happiness, we find meaning, we find purpose, we find each other which is naturally how the universe is, right? The one thing we know about reality we can say is everything has an effect on everything else. There's nothing in the universe that isn't created by causes and conditions. Everything. So you think, you know, in, in America we love to talk about freedom, my choice. 
And in California, what do we like to do? We like to go buy a bottle of wine, isn't it? Most people. You walk into the shop, there are all these different wines. You know something about, oh, Napa Valley, I know oh, and that one I've tried, and you grab it, and you think I did it. My choice. But what about, where did that wine come from? You needed a store. You needed a wine merchant who had, out of all the wines he could buy, decided on a few. You probably had some cues that you saw in the store about this one got 90 points and that one got a gold this and that and that's why you tried one and not the other because somebody's cleverly figured out how to push all your emotional buttons so that you make a choice. Wait a minute. You needed to figure out how to grow grapes. Somebody had to notice that uh, in the old days that fermented uh, uh, drinks were less likely to make you sick than water. It was at one time. People started drinking more than People got better and better at it. You had to have roads to transport it. You had to have um, big industrial machines to be able to put it out in so much quantity that it can reach everybody in, in the state or in the country. You had to have a planet with carbon-based life forms. You can go on and on and on, and you can see in that bottle of wine, your choice is actually the least interesting part of the whole thing, and probably it wasn't very much your choice at all. Right? We were, we were talking earlier today about how you tell people about a certain po policy decision or proposal, and they think about it and they know which way they like. If you tell them whether it's Republican or Democrat that supports it, they actually come to a very different conclusion in many cases. We think it's our decision, but it's all context. It's all interconnectedness. So much of who we think we are is just the product of all the different experiences not only we've gone through, but all of humanity, the whole universe, <coughs> is in that bottle of wine. So first, it's just noticing, just starting to see how much of what we think is us and me and mine is interconnectedness. The second part is relaxing judging. Now, relaxing comparing was this kind of thing we do with ourselves. Judging is what we do to everyone else. About 100 milliseconds after I meet you for the first time, I've come up with all these brilliant ideas about you. A lot of them are wrong, and they're all very hard to shake because of our conditioning, because of our habits, because of our bio biology, because of, I don't know, natural selection, all these different, the, because of the uh, um, bacteria in our guts. <laughs> so, what can we do? Uncover our natural warm-heartedness, our natural propensity, when we're spacious, when we're open, when we're present, a feeling caring, kindness. We can just simply, with our breath, think, I wish everyone's free of suffering. I wish everyone to be happy as we exhale. Free of suffering. Everyone to be happy. This begins to, of course, in the beginning, maybe we're faking it a little bit. Don't worry. Don't compare. <laughs> Just do it. Allow yourself to do it. Say it again and again and again and again and again. And then the natural capacity for love becomes more and more apparent. You know, my brother and I used to really not get along. And my father had a stroke in Mexico. And we both went to take care of him. And um, it was in a hospital. It was a quite a good hospital where they spoke no English. And the way you, I don't know if it's probably still true, you, you put uh, the patient into a barbiturate-induced coma and you gradually bring them out. And they, we didn't speak much Spanish. My brother's genius with languages. By the end of the time we were there, he, he spoke a little Spanish. But, and then he told me all these things he discovered, like, that he, my father had been in a barbiturate and he was home and they were bringing him out. But while my father was coming out, uh, he stopped sleeping. And um, 
the nurses didn't know how to get. So we ended up kind of being his nurse. And, um, and my brother and I didn't have time to do our usual thing. In fact, it never came up. Why? We were thinking about our father. And even though this was a scary, difficult, heart-wrenching situation, my brother and I still, when we get together, will reflect on that time. But when we talk about it, we talk about it joyfully. Because we were only thinking of someone else. Because we were feeling so warm-hearted. It's probably the basis of how my brother and I found our way back to, to communicate and be friends again. I like to share a few things with to you. <coughs> Before I said I'm a devotee of compassion. And I really are a devotee of compassion. How? Um, three years ago, or two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, we were in Nepal in a big temple, and uh, one great lama is giving empowerment, and that is the last day of the empowerment. 11.47 and they have this in the hall and they have seven, eight hundred people in the building and outside they have a few thousands of people and in the building I did, they start putting a small fire puja so I never seen uh, fire puja in the building end of the empowerment circle so I thought it's very amazing to see it and I see it and Rinpoche is in the high throne and I will be staying in the front row after the, the fire begins, then the, the, the shaking, the earth, I thought, wow, Master is so powerful, the earth is shaking. <laughs> but they did not stop. <laughs> so, the first thing that I realized that is, I'm quite near to the glass, where the three, two-story Buddha statues, in three Buddha statues. Three glass plates. So the glass is not like the double, double glazing. It's actually Nepali cheap, thin glass <laughs> with the, you know. So I know all that. <laughs> so when I look at my eye on the glass, I can actually see the glass is actually moving like this. Okay? And I'm, this is my right hand. I'm holding my, my dad, my father, Rinpoche. So I start chanting, you know. They have six lines <laughs> of my master. But then they are... Shock is so amazing. The shock is the, such a memory cutter. You cut the, all the memories, the shock, shots. So, I cannot actually go through the whole thing. Just stuck in the first line. So, I said, Mahanguru, Mahanguru, Mahanguru. Mahanguru is how we call our masters. Guru Padma Sambhava, Lotus Bone. Then my eyes in the in the glass when they're going to break. Because I know it's when they break, the first victim is going to be me. Because it goes like that. They could have pretty sure could have slides me or could have half through and then my dad and somebody and my brother. I don't know miracle. This is not my real question, but I don't know miracle. But what I saw that day, no one single class broke. That is the seven point nine. Forty over second, almost a minute shaken. This is Rinpoche, the old Rinpoche. Okay? He, his whole throne is shaking like this. He's going through the text, you know? <laughs> and after the relax, the shaking, I look, the whole hall is empty. <laughs> Just I saw some Rinpoche in the front row, and I saw me and my brothers, we are some row. We saw one or two monks holding like this to us. <laughs> the monks are so stupid. Some monks holding the pillar. <laughs> because because they, the pillar is going to broke, you know, they want to hold. It's not for the help, but that is a good idea. <laughs> good intention, but it's a bad idea. So everybody run out. No, but they, they have a joke, actually. They have so many iPhone 4, iPhone 5, iPhone 6, iPhone 8, you know, so many, you know, I think 8 or 7 something. There's so many, so many iPhones in that, because they, everybody running, throwing out the iPhones. <laughs> so that is the story that I want to tell, but the real story is that the second day, we cannot sleep in the house because we're so scared. The earth is shaking throughout. It's, the earthquake is such an amazing thing. It's shaking your bone, basically, because earth is something that's unshakable. That is the feeling. 
Wind does shake, water does shake, fire does shake, but earth not. When that earth shakes, you don't have no trust to anyone, meaning anything. So, there are many miracles I don't want to share. One is my two children is in the fifth floor. And of course, after a month later, we, I heard one of my other friends who stay in the fifth and sixth floor, other buildings, they say that the items, the things, the, this and that, that is here, you know, right and left. But my son is actually pooping in the toilet. <laughs> my daughter is climbing on the kitchen to find something. And they both have no one single scratch. Mm. And I, w I run back. My boy's climbing, not smiling actually. Girls little bit crying because of the, the knee. The person who's lo looking after, the nanny, she's completely freeze. Mm. And I saw the second time, she's freeze. Second time, it was 7.5 or 7.4, two weeks after. They say it's after shock, I don't know. But that happened. That time I was in the floor and I saw the nanny. And the nanny goes, ah! and then she just frees. She doesn't run, she doesn't do, she just frees. Mm -hmm. So my two kids, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. It's another miracle for me. Then we stay in the tent. The second day, one of my monks come up. And he's crying. And I said, what happened? And oh, my mother died. I said, how? The house collapsed and it, she died. Then I talked to my wife. I said, now we don't stay like this. We now start to do something. Then third to fourth day begins. Then we start starting the relief act. We did it. And we did so good. Our team did good. So hard. Actually, we reached within two weeks relief. We actually reached to 20 over 1,000 families. Foods, tubs, tents, like that. Number-wise, over 100,000 people we reached. Rich. So the monks, the foreigners, the Nepalese, so, so now my understanding is this. Yes, you say I'm a compassionate person. Yes, I'm a compassionate person. But you really think I'm a compassionate person. And now I look back, I said no. It's quite amazing, right? Mm -hmm. I did relief work. I did so much. That should be compassion, right? Actually, no. You know why? My compassion is act, 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 action compassion. Action compassion is not really compassion, it's an act, it's action, it's a human reaction. The real compassion should be limitless. You understand? I don't know how to... I. So, now I look back, now now I look back, after three years, practicing every day, my practice compassion. So you do creating space or repeating the same thing, uh, relaxing, comparing, present moments, and knowing everything is interconnected. When you start doing that, time to time, slowly by slowly, when you say, I wish everybody happy, I wish everybody free from trouble, when you do this kind of exercise, actually the first thing, the first objective is not to be a nice person. First, no. First, try to find unconditional kind, not kindness. I don't like to use ness because ness is act. I don't like to say the act first. Find the unconditional kind in your heart. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be split second, like a present moment kind of type. It's not going to be long. But that kind present, the warm hearted kind. I don't like to use ness, kindness. Kindness is like tact, being kind. You know? mm -hmm. Being kind. Being kind, kindness is not the word I'm saying just to finding the warm heart or kind uh, present. It's like I say, when you practice in creating space, you're going to feel your heart open. And when you feel really chest and heart open, that is the thing that you need to remember. Actually, I found when you have that moment, that kind presence, have no judgment. That spirit second, the present is so pure, you can accept anyone in. You don't need to accept. The kind actually pervades that second. Bam! Pervades all. When I did the relief work, I'm a very good at giving respect. When you're doing relief work, you're always superior. Because I give things. 
and the poor people say, oh, but you please give me rice, please give me top, you know. So he goes like that, office, and all the monks stand up, okay, give this, this, give this, give this, you know, so easy. So I give, I give very respectfully, very respectfully give. Then what happened is I met one person, very proud. Uh, which village you actually giving all the things? And taking photos, taking our items. Then my friends, our team said, they found another website actually showing all the villages that we're doing and the food saying that they're doing it. You understand? They're coming, taking the photo, saying they're doing it, give us money. You understand? So after that, I saw that guy coming in, acting very hard. I'm so angry. I said, who are you? I said, who the heck you are? <laughs> You are blocking our office. He said, what? It's a problem? I said, yes, it's a problem. Get out. So when I do that, when I see that moment, when I look back, my compassion act is not yet a condition. <laughs> the compassion act is compassion act. It's a bodhisattva act, yes, but not bodhisattva. To become a bodhisattva act, you need to realize you are the bodhisattva first to act. But what we realize is action is so important for us, but being we forgot. You understand? That's why interconnected, feeling interconnected is the very important for me. You know why? Everybody is connected, world is connected, energy is connected, everything what we do is connected. I feel, I realize now more and more and more actually. You know, I never thought about that before, about the wine stuff, you know. <laughs> I actually appreciate, after drinking water, I, I said, oh, thankful, I thank, th thankful everything, you know. The item is very kind, very thankful. I don't want to take advantage, like, oh, okay, brother. You know, yeah, brother. You know, like, who cares, and I can... You know. No, everything is, has energy put in, hours put in, efforts put in, maintained. So, very thankful. So, when you think of interconnected, you become very humble. You, you are the, not the, the spotlight to, you know, everything what we do is, we, I am the spotlight, naturally. But when you do the interconnected, you are the part of it. You want to be the, the part of something, but not into the spotlight. You become humble, actually. Then, relax the judging. I met the person. Right now, I think back the person, the face. I remember him very well, three years ago. I can remember his face. I can remember his act. Right now, I feel very eh, uncomfortable. That is how judgment do. It's like a memory, you know, subconscious memory. You do it something and it press, you know, it's like a, you have a, you know, how hard you put in the ground goes deeper. But in the, in the emotional level, the depth is actually don't have no measurement. The only measuring is how strong you hold. How strong you actually hold those, those times. That is the depth. The depth of measuring is the clinging, the judging, not actually the number or, or this, you know, this. Yeah? So relaxing the judging is so crucial. Rel find your kind, warm heart. Yeah? My English is not good. No, that's good. Right now I'm going to do some dissection in English because I don't want to use any of, of the action word. So being kind, kindness, I don't like to use that word. So I'm going to dissect the action word and just keep this word kind. Warm, hearted, split second kind that pervades all and unconditioned. Now that Whenever you feel uh, alone, alone, whenever you feel your compassion is not uh, 
increasing. Go back to that. Remember that. <coughs> you know the kind, warm hearted is actually progressive, you know, all progressive. It's actually very vast. So, <coughs> relaxing the judging is actually part of how to bring the warm heart kind bring up. Then you do with your hand. <coughs> I wish all happiness. I wish all being beautiful. I wish all. When you do that, you actually repeating in your head, but you actually generating in your heart. It's like a old nineteen mm, twenties uh, uh, trucks. You know, you have a kind of pull in the uh, um, engine, and you go <coughs> like that kind of things. We want first. Right now, our heart is a little bit old engine. So we practice a little bit hard, more on, more on. Then it becomes automatic. You just go in. You just press now the twenty-first century car. You just press start or stop. <laughs> Already on. Really. So beginning is a little hard for us. So we start doing. Right now, we all fine, kind of. So what we're talking about is not so value. The value only comes when you really need it. But the problem is, when you really need it, you're not trained yet, you're not reminded yet, you not re cannot be remembered. That's a right. Right now, when you are fine, try to remind, try to exercise a little bit, mental exercise, practice a little bit, thirty minutes per day. When you really need it, that going to day really going to helpful to you. Okay, so the. The third one is be attentive. You know, like um, <clears throat> the way an experienced hostess is at a party. You might have a difficult guest, but what does she do? She brings the host. Could be a heat to them to sing hostess. She brings the guest favorite drink, delicious food, a nice chair, whatever the guest needs. And we've all been at these parties where. There's somebody who could potentially derail a party, and the way the host responds, right, makes or breaks the party. And it's always by being attentive, by bringing our warm heart into action, into activity. So we start, as Rinpoche is saying, with just kind, and then bring it. First, we have to experience it in ourselves, and then meeting the needs of others. I cannot find good word. I know more than the kind. I, I love to have some good words. Kind heart. Kind. Simsum. Okay. Yeah, simsum. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. Every word ends up having a slight problem. So we're <laughs> in the book. It's a warm heart. Simsum. So this is clear. So now maybe we go. So yes. So radical. One thing we want to say radical. What why is why? <laughs> why? Why radical? <laughs> because what does radical mean in Latin? Root. Ah. And what have we lost? The root of happiness. And now the problem is how do we find it? Well, we have to do something radical. Radical shift. A little bit radical. <laughs> Slight, but radical shift. <laughs> In the way we live our lives. Where we place our attention. How we respond to ourselves, to the world. It needs a little bit of a radical method, because otherwise we're always going to be prisoner to the habitual way of responding to thoughts, the habitual <laughs> way of responding to people, the habitual way of doing everything. So we begin, we call it cultivating dignity, but it's notice bringing together basic and interconnected happiness. Just, you do these practices, these exercises, and you get a taste, yes, as experience. First. You try to understand it, then you try to try it out, then you see. As you see, you have confidence, right? After you've done uh, a little bit of meditation, 
it doesn't matter. I can come and see you and tell you everything you know is wrong, but you go, no, I know it's not wrong because I experienced it. I tasted present moment awareness. I tasted that moment of noticing I was distracted, free from even the thought of whether I was distracted or not. And you have confidence that you can bring that moment into situations. Same way, you uncover your warm heart. You see your capacity. And you bring that into situations. And you begin to have confidence in it. And this confidence is the beginning of what we call dignity, different than pride. It's just knowing what you know, not in comparison to someone else, not through judging someone else, but just knowing what you know. And then we talk about relax the clinging. This subtle, subtle kind of still stickiness. Oh, I like present moment awareness. It's so peaceful. And we're back in depending on circumstances, right? The great thing about going out in the world is it's chaotic because circumstances aren't dependable. And we begin, we can bring through the power of present moment awareness even more warm heart to the situations, to people, to ourselves. So basic happiness and interconnected happiness begin to reinforce each other. The problem, of course, with interconnected happiness is I'm doing something really nice and I expect other people to see it. Or I expect to feel good about it. Or other people need to do something. Or other people need to do, right. So, but present moment awareness, we're able to catch ourselves and not go there. So you see? So that relax the clinging is really working that subtle, stubborn stickiness. And then finally, be aware. Don't be like dog. Be like lion. Don't be like a dog. Be like a lion. <laughs> and why is that? What does it mean to be a dog? Don't chase out. <laughs> Look in like a lion. You throw a stone at a dog. What does a dog do? <laughs> he chases the stone. You throw a stone at a lion, Rinpoche. What does a lion do? He turns <laughs> and look at the stone thrower. And you run if you're the stone thrower, or you get eaten. Either way, no more stones. In the same way, when we turn our attention away from always chasing thoughts and emotions like a dog chasing stones and turn it in to what it is the source of those thoughts and emotions. No more stones. So there are a lot of exercises in very nice ones and a very scientific research about, about this many, many times. I, I don't know, they in here, they, my favorite is the duck. Yeah, that one we couldn't put in because... <laughs> that was uh, my most favorite one. <laughs> well, we couldn't my my biology teacher, maybe, maybe one of you... You have to in water in the next one. What's that? The duck. Well, no, the, the, you know, the, the gray yeah. light goose uh, that, no. that um, was coming in, I forget the, uh, his name, you know, the guy that stayed. What? Well, what is it? The gray light goose. You know, the, the one the who duck, studied it all the time. Dr. Conrad Lorenz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lorenz. So my biology teacher, Imprinting. yes, he talked about how the gray light goose was um, coming into Conrad Lorenz's house. He was studying goose. And he, and he had some that he made friends with. And this one was coming in every day to eat in the kitchen. But on the way in the door, he would see himself in the mirror and he'd think it's another goose and he'd start pecking at the mirror. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And then they got worried about this, so they removed the mirror, but he kept pecking. Oh. Okay, well, that's okay. But what's interesting is the, the offspring started doing the same thing. They come in the door and they peck. 
Unfortunately, I looked at all his books. I couldn't find the reference. My uh, biology teacher has passed away. <laughs> this is like so long ago. He was already not that. He was probably in his 50s. I thought that it was so, so nice. So, you know, I couldn't find a, a way to probably footnote it. Maybe he made it up. I don't know. But anyway, so, so we took out, we went to the Kvetch. So here's the thing. <laughs> what is Kvetch? Kvetch. Kvetch. Well, that's okay, what I okay, do okay. in the J. I, 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 I can complain. Kvetch. You see, <laughs> it's Yiddish for com, kind, a particular kind of complaint. I know. My grandparents. <laughs> my grandparents. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. And, and it never stops. <laughs> so my, my grandparents, Kvetch, but they lived through some really, really horrible things. My grandmother's village was burned when she was a child. They, they, they basically starved walking to France where they managed to have enough money left to take the boat to America where things got much better. For example, so of course they complained about stupid, meaningless stuff. It was a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. The problem is, by the time it gets to my generation, it's just complaining about <laughs> stupid, meaningless stuff. <laughs> we were pecking on the wall. We were pecking on the wall. <laughs> so that story is in, in, the, in the book. I think, I think why I really liked it, I, I'm not, uh, I've never done research, I'm not a scientist, but... Uh, you never converge. But I really like this story because the, when you start meditating well, your offspring would have some kind of uh, meditative uh, habits, you know. So I don't know if the human being works or not, but I, I hope it works like the duck to the human beings. <laughs> so uh, that is the way to encourage father and a mother or future father and mother who want to see the world a little bit better. You start meditating, your offspring going to be much more towards the meditation. And I get better. This is what I, I, I thought, but never done this. I never heard research like that before. But the duck was very beautiful. But said, sadly, it's not inside, doesn't it? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter of that. But it's okay. So, so this is our kind of sharing. So the reason behind that we radical happy. We actually we discuss so much about being happy and we look at ourselves, look at our masters, and everything. So these, we found this, like our old meditation master, they're so nice, so warm, so kind, so present, so happy, so smiling. And I have now some of my mentors. You give him not good thing. But Rumpa said, you have high blood pressure. How to eat this pill? No, he's helping me. Like, always kind of smiling. So he gave me one idea. That is my one of my principles, but I forgot to tell you bit. Whenever I'm with my wife, I forget. That is the problem. You know, the old man, you know, I'm a cripple, so I forget my stick. That means what happens. Always fail. So whenever I see my wife and his friend, I always forget. But that is my principle of my life, is open and ease. Um, yeah. Carefree ease. Huh? Carefree ease. Carefree <coughs> ease. That is. Huyang Rode. Nelson. Huyang Rode. Huyang Rode. The. Relaxed and beyond. Huyang yeah. Rode. This is the, my principle of my behavior. So, yeah, so this is the today sharing, okay? So, anyone like to ask questions? And I have a, <coughs> if we might, because this will go to many people, we hope. Yes. yes. They don't have to watch, but they have the option. So, um, please, it's, it's considered a kindness to teachers to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you. No, traditionally. Yeah. You know, and there's no questions besides this. <laughs> so um, we may want to repeat the questions, or Eric, why don't you? That's yes, my usual job. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So please. Yes. I really like your talk. Thank you so much. My question is: Will you say just to be kind? Uh, can, can I say is to be a good person? Is uh, can I say uh, in 
know, to be a just good person is better than just do good things. So the question is, when you say to be kind, is it to be a good person? Is it better? Can you say it's better to be a good person than to do good things? Oh, okay, good. Um, it's important to start with being a good person, but it's also okay to do good things. And even you can say, if you do good things, you're a lot more likely to end up being a good person. I think that, you know, we're always evaluating, am I a good person? Am I doing good things? Oh, that was good. No, that was bad. Here, what we're trying to say is that just relax the judging, relax the comparing. Don't even worry about whether you're a good person. Don't worry so much about whether you're doing good things. Instead, for example, ask yourself, will this action I'm going to take make it more likely that I experience myself and others free from bias? Hmm. So what you see is that we're living always in denial, often in denial of interconnectedness. When you steal something, does that make it easier to experience the interconnected nature reality or harder? Just, you can begin to ask yourself these questions. You can look. And so this is why. So when I feel warm-hearted, when I feel warm-hearted, how does that inform my behavior? When I allow my behavior to be informed by my care of myself, of others, what are my actions? I, I think it, it just, because the problem with I'm a good person or I'm good actions, it always has for us a little bit of a judgment or a little bit of a comparison. And it, 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 this is something we're trying to say a little bit more subtle than that, a little bit more gentle, a little bit more fun too. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, being good is, good person is important. Doing good is the way to find how to be a good person. Doing good is actually to try to find out what it means good person. So in New York City one day I giving money to one homeless man. The moment I went to the homeless man, <laughs> like this, you know. Then I run away, I'm a little scared too, and one of my my disciples, he almost tried to I blocked homeless because he thought that homeless attacking me. Then I said, I think, no, 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 I think we did some mistake, mistakes. Go talk to him. Mm. And he slowly went, we like to give you your money. And the homeless says, I just beat yesterday night. Mm. Some people came and beat me and put a spray in my eyes. Mm. So I thought when you're coming towards me, I thought you are attacking. Mm. So now, I'm doing good, but I can be very upset when I don't go back again. Mm -hmm. So when I, what my practice is, I always try to see that person is me. Then the perspective is completely different. Mm -hmm. yes. Doing good does not mean you're always good. Doing good will seeing their perspective in your mm -hmm. you to you then you are a good person. Okay? Yes. Yes, good. Um, first of all, thank you very much. I, I think for the people here, well, speaking for myself, um, I look forward to being Kuyang and Lode, watching the video again. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, the relaxation, Kuyang, and then Lode being beyond judging with mine. For people here who have some knowledge, maybe it's knowledge, maybe not so much transformation, maybe a lot of transformation, um, there's, a, there's practices in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that um, seem like prayer. So even though I'm sure it's not in the book because we're all modern and nobody wants to hear about prayer, that's 
religious stuff. Could you say something about how to bring prayer into Kuyang and Lode? Or how it relates, or if it's different, it's something about prayer. Easy question. I think we did prayer tonight. I think when we say with our out breath, may all beings be happy, and we really mean it, mm -hmm. it's a prayer. It's a wish. How is that different? When we breathe in, may everyone be free from pain. Mm -hmm. It's a prayer. It's an aspiration. I don't. I mean, I think we did. You know, maybe maybe because we're, we're not praying to God. I guess it's that what, what qualifies as a prayer. We're just making the aspiration that everyone be everyone be happy. Everyone have the causes of happiness. Also, everyone be free from pain. And it's you know, as sincerely as we can manifest, it's the beginning. Hmm. I'm thinking, you know, Mon Lan and many yes, it's a, it's big topic. Yes, it's so interesting. When you look at the, the result of the practice, you see the meditation, you see the behavior, the conduct, and you see the view. Mm -hmm. When you look at the view, you see the result, you see the meditation, and you see the behavior. Okay. Now you look at the conduct, Koyang Lo De. Carefree ease is mm -hmm. one way to say, mm -hmm. or <coughs> openness mm -hmm. and beyond. Mm -hmm. When you look at that, the, the word and the meaning, and to, ex to understand, you know, through experience level, you see the view there, you see the meditation there, and you see the result there. Mm -hmm. The amazing part of the Vajrayana Tantric, the secret, is that you must see all that four within in the one. Mm. No matter where corner you look, you never lost. Mm. So the prayer, yes, exists. Uh, we have Guru Yoga that has a prayers of mm -hmm. Kuyang Lode, kind of. Lama Gyambu. Lama Gyambu. It has aspiration, always talking about Kuyang Lode. They have a lot of other prayers that actually infuse with Kuyang Lode all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So you cannot be achieved carefree ease without meditating in nature. <laughs> That's the whole trick about it. <laughs> so I believe in prayer. Yes, yeah. I'm a brainwash. <laughs> One. Yes, yes, Professor. Can you unpack a little bit the moment of transformation that you say is out of clock time that takes uh, the shift mm -hmm. in perspective mm -hmm. But it's more than a shift of perspective, because if you're talking about finding kind, mm -hmm. the transformation, mm -hmm. as far as my understanding, might be to find the kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's a radical reformulation of the moment's purpose. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of... Good question. Please repeat. Yeah, please no, repeat. Essentialize. No, no, no. Just, just the essence. Yes, yes, yes. My English. <laughs> Unpack was his first word. <laughs> the moments of transformation. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the thing is that this finding the moment of kind, there's so much in there, and could we please unpack it and say a bit more of how that process actually mm -hmm. begins to unfold and, 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 and and even just the radical nature of that. Is there something else you want to... Well, it's also tied to the behavioral intention mm -hmm. of meditation. And how that is tied to the behavioral intention of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, intention. Yeah. It's actually a very interesting. Wonderful question. Billion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're going to ask for the payment. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it's really interesting that I found out that when I try to see the, my five negative thoughts or negative emotions or, or negative reactions, such as anger, jealousy, pride, that is very traditional anger, jealousy, pride, 
attachment and ignorance. They all, you can actually go through all that, you can reflect, you can see, actually all's and ends in you. They all ends on you. Angry. Who's angry? Me. Okay? Who's jealous? Jealous, jealous, jealousy. It's no problem. I am jealous. Everything goes down towards eyes. When I meditate, just say, not meditate, exercise or creating space, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one part of the directing to see the kind. When I do, I wish all being happiness and free from suffering. That is one angle of looking at the kind. Mm -hmm. When I see relaxing the judging and relaxing the comparing, I see one angle of the kind. Mm -hmm. Then I try to do, okay, everything's interconnected, reality. That means I become momently, I think, I become humble. Because now I know I'm not important. <laughs> <laughs> when I become humble, that humbleness directing actually the kind. Mm -hmm. Then I say, okay, all that experience and what is have is a, actually has a presence. Mm -hmm. The presence is a very strong. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't need to love myself. I am love. Mm -hmm. When I say I love myself, one way I love that, but one way I lead a hate. Because why I'm not love myself again? <laughs> See, for me it's like a reminder, you know, kind of say, you're so bad, you know, you can't love yourself, you know. I say, I'm loving myself all the time, what is wrong with that, you know? <laughs> so the point is not that, loving or not loving, no. The point is directing different exercising to f directing one place, a kind. When you experience that, that has a presence. And the presence actually called dignity. Mm -hmm. You go out, somebody say, you. <laughs> you hurt, but you're not shake. Mm -hmm. Many times we hurt and we shake. Mm -hmm. Shake from the core. You don't doubt the person, you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. That means you don't have no dignity. And now all the direct to that kind, that kind becomes presence. And that presence becomes the view, the meditation, the conduct, and the result. So now you think, did I create that? You actually know that you can't create. You know it's already presence. You cannot manufacture. You cannot manufacture the feelings. Because when you make a fighter, you could be comparing, you start judging. So you need to see it split secondly, feel that warm, kind, but not cannot be manufactured. When they know what happens, that the, the beam of light is going to on. Said, actually I'm already quite good person. <laughs> and now that is the most important because you don't need to self-empowered. You are the empowerment. You are the empowerment. You, you don't need love to know yourself. You are the love. And for me, that is the most important for me right now, is the that. And with that intention, I smile at people, I, eat to, I write the book, and I try to do, talk with the people. You're always humble. That is the unique about that, is you're always humble. You don't need to be humble, you're always in the ground. You know that. So that is, say, I realized it is very important, uh, you know, the warm-hearted, warm heart and kind. And, and so where do we start? Start from the book. <laughs> of course, and it's only twenty four ninety five. Find bookstores everywhere, and <laughs> you're not going to find anywhere from this book. <laughs> Just joking. It is a really the, joke. The way to start very joke. is to not worry so much about intention, but to do each practice 
as fully and as authentically as we can, because in that moment of authenticity, all these qualities that Rinpoche are talking about just naturally occur. And it's through that that we find it. 95% of the message here is actually our teachers. Mm -hmm. The 5%, uh, 5 per per percent is some stories, some things that we like to share, and some words that we explained, you know, translate, retranslate the words. But the rest of the things all goes to our father and masters. True. Anyone? We didn't, make, we didn't make anything up. Okay. Um, on the note, thank you so much. Um, on the note of teachers, um, what role do you guys see uh, individual people practicing um, requiring a teacher, and at what stage? Um, especially in like this modern context <laughs> of, of going out to everyone. Repeat. Um, in the question is about the role of teachers and at what stage you think it's important in this crazy modern world to find where is a teacher fit? Is it necessary? When should one find a teacher? Is this that kind of question? Thank you. It's important to have mentors. There isn't anything any of us ever accomplished without the kindness of a mentor, right? We, we go to school, we had somebody who, who showed us something we couldn't otherwise know. Of course, we can learn a lot from books, but if you think about your peak educational experiences in school, they always involved a mentor. It wasn't just from a book. We have them outside of school, and we wrote this book. You can take this book, and the book can be your mentor in a way, but at some point, it's good, if you feel inspired, to meet a living, breathing teacher because it accelerates something because you, they know you. So my, one of the, I had a mentor in Silicon Valley, this woman whose house we're going to tomorrow, and I mean, remember when she put me on her staff, she said, I'm putting you on my staff, and if you fuck up, you're fired. <laughs> right. Right. But actually, she saw me. It, she, not the thing she would say to anyone. She saw me. She saw something about me and how I function, and actually behind it was so much love. She's somebody who really showed me the key to success in business is to be kind, to be loving. Of course, <laughs> you doesn't mean you never have to fire anyone, but you can fire people with dignity. You can let them go with dignity. There are conditions, there are circumstances, it's not, but that behind it, you'll get so much more done. And this, in this moment, that was her way of showing me kindness. So, I progressed in my career as an entrepreneur, as an executive, you name it, so much because of this person, because it went beyond anything. Of course I read all the books, and I did benefit, but this was the accelerant, the little that made the flame. <laughs> When you see radical happy, when you see happy, <clears throat> what what comes in your mind? Mm, a feeling more than an image. No. Mm. So how are you going to teach somebody how to feel? <laughs> The so book does not actually do every single mentor that should do, no. But the book is the way to reach people, to make them feel a little bit better so they can find a, some good teacher, or some teacher, wherever, whoever they want to be, I hope the good one, and have sincerely started learning to feel. So, now, that is the answer. This teacher is important. 
word cannot express feeling completely. Feeling need to be filled, introduced through the word. But word cannot become a feeling, I think. So, teja is important. Okay? And uh, that's it for today. Yes? Just quick follow-up, and maybe it's a good place to, to conclude. Um, well, she asked about a teacher, and my beloved friend Eric morphed it to mentor. Um, but the teacher, you mentioned Vajrayana today, and I haven't read the book yet, I'm sorry, just came out, but it seems that this is for secular humanists, Yes. and if it's for Buddhists, well, so he says no, you say yes. It, okay. it is for them, but not okay. only for them. And, um, Hopefully it won't be part of the mindfulness, but maybe it will be. We'll see what happens. Maybe if a person is attracted to Buddhism, it's Shravakayana or Mahayana. But then you were talking 95% is from your teacher's Kanya, Trukurugin mm -hmm. and everything. And there's almost like hidden Chagchen Sokchen there, but we don't, you don't mention the words. So my question is, uh, in virtually everything I've seen about Vajrayana, I'm not even talking Mahamudra Sochen, you have to have a teacher that's more, you know, um, Gewe Shenyan, mm -hmm. you know, but this is, this is, it's more, and there's a key term, and I'm wondering if you address it here, and if not, I mean in the book, maybe just for inspiration you could say something, Jinlop, Blessings. Blessings. Mm -hmm. And blessings is not a good feeling of kind heart. So if you don't address it, how would you address it tonight? You know, if you don't address it in the book. And and I could be wrong, I'm sure I'm wrong about many things, but it seems um, it, one of my teachers said you need two things, two things. Jinla, blessings, and Nyingru, fierceness. So the Nin Ru, I think, is there you talked about. So could you say something about blessings, which sounds, you know, it has a special meaning, grace, energy. How does Jinla relate to this and the necessity of having a teacher, a guru? It's not in your book, probably, but I'm asking you just as... No, but stories about our interactions with our teachers are in the book. I mean, you know, you know it's there. I'm not talking about the stories, I'm talking but about showing the, the necessity of having a teacher in Jinla. It's a very important yeah. necessity of blessings, and the blessings should be unbroken. And the blessings should be kept by the master clean. Mm -hmm. So for example, like myself, I receive the blessings from my teacher, and I keep every single day keeping putting charcoals in the water so water can be keep the fresh. Mm -hmm. So that's how we say Wangi Chuo Manyamba, meaning the blessings of empowerment, the water is should be not uh, not broken flow. The flow should be continuous. Mm -hmm. So when we receive empowerment we actually receive the water from the base and we drink. Mm -hmm. And that is the same thing he received from his teacher. And that water is on all the way down to my myself and I keep my samaya well. That is how I keep the blessings. It's my commitment. Commitment. When moment I broke my samaya, the the blessing going to be damaged. Then I reconfess, do the prayers to clean up the my samaya. Mm -hmm. Very important. When you have blessings, meditation come to you. You don't need to go to meditation. <coughs> you see the nature with so hard work, but when you have blessings, imagine. 10,000 hours done practice fall into you, what happens? You don't need to do yourself too much. That is the blessings. When you do yourself, you can get it, but you need 10,000 hours to put in. <laughs> when you have a blessings, you don't need. How, how to receive the blessings? You can receive it or you can by giving, both. So you need to receive it from your practice, supplication, recitation, meditation, and inseparability, unity with the masters. And that is how you receive the blessings and how you maintain it. 
and end of the day, I want to see the all beings have the same nature of my master. Mm. Now that is the all pervasive blessings. Mm. So this is how you keep it. And uh, when we making the book, we discuss so much about our masters. Mm -hmm. Talk about things that what we doing is right or wrong. We discuss so much. That's why we put a lot of the examples traditional. Don't be like dog. Be like a lion. It's very traditional. Mm. And we use a lot of relaxing comparing, relaxing judging, relaxing clinging in happiness book. Because we know that is the most important essence. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that's why we sort of brought being and I we hope everybody gets some blessing from the masters, but they really won't get fully, then you need to go into the uh, through this somewhere. <laughs> Maybe a follow up book could be um, radically blessed. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that sounds, sounds good. Yeah. Sounds yeah. Yeah. It sounds very good. So, are there Thank any more so questions? Much, thank you. No? Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming.